Welcome, welcome, welcome to another OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. My name is Brandon Drum. I'm here with Parker Thune, and I'm battling. I'm battling. I'm battling. I'm battling through a uh, whatever this is. It's hurt, not, not injured. Yep, hurt, not injured. Uh, fever's fine. <laughs> you know, we still pa- we power through. So, um, yeah, uh, Bedlam week, and that is the reason why I'm powering through because it is Bedlam week, and it, there is a huge, huge, huge visitor list uh, that we've got to get into. And by the way, I know I'm going to throw this up off the top. Um, there is another, another. Notre Dame commit that's going to be visiting this weekend. By the way, I'm throwing that off all the top. Right. I'm coming from the top rope. It doesn't take a whole lot of detective work either. No. No. It's in the 2024 class. Um, One of the top defensive linemen in the country. He is a teammate of one... Oh, you commit um, Logan Halland. Owen Waffle. I love the last name, by the way. I, it, it, it's breakfast time, so I really, really... Waffle. <laughs> Waffles are good, man. Waffles are good. I love the last name. He... he uh, Waffle likes to pancake other linemen. Hmm. See what I did there? All right. All right, yeah. Dad jokes, dad, 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 dad jokes galore to uh, start the podcast. <laughs> but seriously, no, like that tells you how big a weekend it is that there is, and there's others that we've heard little buzzes that there might be some people showing up. Um, have you heard the buzz about Jeremiah Love, the 2023 running back, four star running back as well for St. Louis? I have not heard that. I've heard some interesting buzz about a couple other four star names, but Jeremiah Love is he is he committed to Notre Dame? Yeah. So there's another one. Dang. Yeah, I I don't know if it's if he's visiting or not because I haven't I haven't asked him, but I got hit up by a Notre Dame reporter yesterday and said, "Hey, what is this?" And people are talking about Oklahoma and Jeremiah Love all over the Notre Dame stuff, and I have not heard that. So that's something we're going to have to dig into because it doesn't make sense with two running backs already committed. Unless they feel like there's going to be another exit in the running back room, which I don't think there is. That doesn't make sense. Unless Marcus Major decides he's going to dip out would be my only guess. But I can't see that happening. Can you? I guess I could see that happening. Yes. I mean, you could, but I, I don't think that will happen. Yeah. So... There's just a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff going on. And that's kind of the point of this start of this podcast, that there is a huge, huge visitor list in Oklahoma needs very, 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 very badly to play well this weekend. Night game, national television. Finally get to see the LED lights again for the third time this year out of 12 games. Only oh, so Oklahoma to five and five, Brandon. You don't get to play under the. It line wouldn't line. matter. God. Freaking Big Twelve and eleven a.m. kickoffs. It wouldn't matter. Eh. Mm. I well, think it matter. Really, because I mean, even TCU undefeated. They've been almost exclusively eleven and two p.m. this year. No, they, their last two games have been in prime time. They right, but before time, that, they were time. all eleven and two though. 11 and 2 2 p.m. kickoffs like yeah but i mean because nobody took them seriously until i guess it's yeah. over yeah that's fair but still i don't know this conference man this conference uh i know the sec is not going to be any better they like those 12 p.m. kickoffs so um let's talk about bedlam before we get into the recruiting part and let's talk about spencer sanders and his injury and I saw a tweet, and it was like, I don't remember who it was. There was multiple of them, actually. And I don't remember who it was or who who both of them or three of them were, but they were talking about how Spencer Sanders will 
start off really strong with whatever they've given him to get in the game and play. And then as the game goes on, his arm strength just fizzes out. And that's been the big struggle with them. Have you noticed that watching them as yeah, well? Yeah, I think a lot of people have noticed that. It's been a talking point. And I think it's pretty it's pretty evident, right, that Spencer Sanders is not at 100%. Because if he was at 100% or even remotely close to it, if you like he would have started last weekend against Iowa State instead of getting called out of the bullpen when things just about went haywire with Gunnar Gundy at the controls, Garrett Rangel, whatever uh, conglomeration of quarterbacks Oklahoma State has thrown out over the last few weeks in Spencer Sanders' stead. But there's little question that he is by far the best option that Oklahoma State has in the position. And it's not unlike the situation Oklahoma's in, right? Where you got a quarterback right. that you're confident in as the starter, but beyond that, it is ugly. It is slim picking to try and find anybody else in that room that is going to be able to give you a chance to win a football game. So Oklahoma State needs Spencer Sanders as close to full health as possible. Do you think that Garrett Rangel or – Gundy will end up starting this game. Do you, do you no, expect? No, I think. It'll be- I, I, yeah, I expect Sanders because Bedlam to get out there. One of the last games of the season, they're trying to make sure they get up to nine wins. And so, with that being said, do you like Oklahoma's odds better, knowing that Sanders is maybe sixty? 60- Five percent at best right now. Uh, I mean, you kind of gotta you gotta take it with a grain of salt, right? And you kind of gotta fight your knee jerk reaction because, on the one hand, yes, it does make you feel better about the situation, just knowing that Spencer Sanders is not going to be a hundred percent. But then again, you know what Spencer Sanders' skill set consists of, right? And it's exactly the same skill set that every single quarterback that's thrashed Oklahoma thus far this year Legs. also has. So mobility and and a a propensity to create off script. Yeah. That's what Spencer Sanders excels at. And so regardless of how healthy he is, regardless of how close to full strength he is, just based on the way that Oklahoma has – not been able to handle quarterbacks of that ilk to this point in the year. You can't really be too confident if you're a Sooner fan heading into this football game. You can be hopeful. You can be optimistic. Sure. But confidence, I don't know where that would be coming from after some of the performances that we've seen defensively over the last couple of months. Right. Well, I guess, I guess the, the other question Hey, isn't it? Doesn't it kind of remind you? Twenty twenty didn't didn't Sanders come in banged up to begin with, in that one as well, and yes. Oklahoma knocked yes, him yes. out. So, I think that's happened. How many how many times has that happened in the last three or four years? Like he's come in, just hanging on by a thread. He's been banged up battle. a lot. Yeah, yeah, several times, right? And that has turned into Oklahoma's Oklahoma's favor. So I, I don't know, man. Like for me, it's 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 interesting. I mean, does history repeat itself? Type deal is where I'm kind of at right now. Like, does Oklahoma? And I'm not saying they're going to knock him out, but does the fact that he is banged up the way he is give Oklahoma some sort of or a little bit of an advantage? I, I guess it gives them a little bit of an advantage, but I think that advantage, again, it can't be regarded as a significant or a substantial advantage just because of the fact that, you know, we're dealing with, <laughs> we're dealing with a defense. We're dealing with an Oklahoma. Defense. No, I get it. Yeah. And so, sure. Yes. It is an advantage. Is an advantage that's going to win Oklahoma the football game? I I don't know if I'd go that far. <laughs> what the 109th ranked defense in the country isn't isn't somebody something you have super confidence? Like in I'm right sorry now? if if you can't if you can't prevent Garrett Green 
from leading a fourth quarter comeback against your program. Forgive me if I'm not that optimistic that you can do much more against 70% of Spencer Sanders. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm with you. Um, Where, what does Oklahoma have to do to win this game? Well, they haven't played well. I mean, that's the obvious. The, I mean, play defense, you know, <laughs> catch the ball. <laughs> keep, keep heat on Spencer Sanders literally all night. Fluster him. Rush his decision-making process. That's what mm-hmm. it boils down to for me. Maintain pressure on the quarterback. And for the love of all that is holy, do not give Oklahoma State wide open running lanes. It's not that much to ask, I don't think, but that's where it starts for OU. And again, like most years, Oklahoma State has a more than adequate defensive unit. And so it's probably going to limit your ability to take the top off to a certain extent. And this is going to be more of a ground and pound uh, war of attrition in the trenches. And I don't anticipate a very high scoring game. All things considered, when I look at the state of these two offenses, yeah. uh, as well as these two defenses, I, I just don't figure there will be a lot of points scored. This feels like one that hits the under, especially with the frigid weather conditions that we're going to have Saturday night. So it's going to, uh, like, to be honest, Brandon, this feels like exactly the type of game. It feels like it's going to be exactly the type of game that Oklahoma has repeatedly demonstrated an inability to finish in 2020. Yeah which I think is what worries me. No, I, and I'm assuming you expect OU to lose the ball game. I am picking Oklahoma state. Yeah. I remember you did that on the live. I was just seeing if you change your tune a little bit. So I don't know. I, I I'm, I'm still going to go. I'm going to go Oklahoma 33, 30. Um, but as I told you, I don't know that I believe that <laughs> I'm doing it just because they've got to win at some point. They got, to, they can't keep losing. I cannot see a team with this much talent. They've got to figure out a way to win at some point. Will it be 2023? But when they figure out a way, when they start figuring out how to win, probably, but me being I don't want to be pessimistic all the time. I get it. Like that defense, I have no trust in Oklahoma's defense at all. I used to trust Oklahoma's offense. But it, my trust doesn't come from my lack of trust doesn't come from Dylan Gabriel. My lack of trust comes from others like people that I expected to be able to trust that are considered some of the best at their position. They've just been inconsistent this year. And I don't know that I trust this as good as the offensive line has played this year. They played equally as bad on fourth and third and shorts. Does that make sense? No, it's it. (laughs) You're exactly right. It's almost like this defense has been really, really good until they have to be. Yep. And then the offense has been really, really good until they have to be. And if it's fourth and one, bam. That's what happens. They just don't get the first down. And I and, and I don't know why. And I'm look, I'm a Levy supporter, and I think Levy is a great OC. But what has happened to Braden Willis in the Willie Cat? Like, what's happened? I mean, they, to be honest, they, they haven't really needed it because Eric Gray has been so dominant. But if you're talking about short yardage situations like the fourth and three in no man's land that Oklahoma faced last week towards the tail end of that game of West Virginia. Uh, I don't know, man, that, that might be, I think that would be a useful situation to have that type of thing in the chamber. 
if he needed to pull it out. But man, look, I I'm very much of the opinion as well that you don't start getting gimmicky until you know what your identity is offensively and you can establish consistent rhythm with the things that you need to be doing for 70, 75 snaps a game as opposed to five or 10. And Oklahoma just hasn't been there. They haven't. Right. And Eric Gray has been the one consistent aspect of this offense. And if there is an aspect of your offense that you'd like to have consistency with, it's the backfield, right? It's the running back position. You want to be able to establish the run. The Sooners have been able to do that, but Outside of Eric Gray, man, nobody, nobody has been all that consistent. Guys have had moments, but those moments have been fleeting and they've been sporadic. Yeah. No, I so let let's talk about it. it if you're Oklahoma right now, how would you attack this Oklahoma State defense? I I say you give EG the ball and let him go with how well he's played this year. Like, what else is there? Especially on a cold night, like, what else is there? Yeah, you handle I mean, it, it, cold handle night doesn't Greg. exclude you from catching a pass and throwing the ball. Like that's well, sure. Sure, but especially on a night like this, like we're going to see this. It's not back. supposed to be windy at all. It's only supposed to be like six mile per hour wind. Um, I know, but you got to you got to factor in the cold, right? It's hard to throw the ball in the cold, and mm. I mm. I think it is going to be, and again, like I mentioned, I think it's you're looking at a low scoring football game. I think it is going to be the type of night where if Oklahoma is going to get a win. They're going to need Eric Gray to have exactly the type of game that he's had over the last three, four contests where you hand him the rock 25, 30 times, and he's well north of 100 rushing yards. And right. he's the one that's primarily moving the ball downfield because it's just it, the passing game has been so inconsistent. And I don't think that's 100% on Dylan Gabriel at all, right? Like everybody, and I, it might be the one play that everybody has indelibly etched in their memory from that West Virginia game, the wide open touchdown pass that Marvin Mims dropped. Right. And that's, that's the guy that coming into the year, and I would argue this is still the case, but coming into the year, everybody figured, okay, if there's one skill position player on offense that is truly elite, it's Marvin Mims. And so even your best skill position player has not been impervious to those types of slip ups, those types of mishaps that can prove costly in the end. And so with that in mind, you also look at the fact that Braden Willis did not have a catch on record last weekend. Who can you rely on right now offensively? And there's one answer and that answer is Eric Gray. So yeah, you, it's, it's, what I'm saying is throw what you know, stick with your studs. And right now your stud without question is Eric Gray. I just, I just, I just don't go into the. I agree with you. Got to stick with him, but I just don't go into the mindset of that. It's you've got to. It, it's harder to throw in the cold because Ohio State does it, Michigan does it. Like that's what they do. Um, obviously, Michigan runs uh, Blake all the time, but. Ohio State throws the ball like 50 times a game in wind and 20-degree weather. <laughs> yeah, but you also have to consider the fact that Ohio State is the nation's best passing offense, right? That's not. Right, but I'm just saying that I, as somebody – I was a wide receiver, so I'm, I'm just saying that like cold hurts when it catch, – it, it hurts a little bit, but that's why you have your hand warmer so it doesn't sting as bad and you got gloves on. And as long as there's no wind, that shouldn't affect your throwing. Like you should like that shouldn't affect anything. That's that's if it does, if it caught if the cold weather causes with no wind. Now, if it's windy and cold, oh, I'm on board with that 100 percent. But if it's six mile per hour like it's supposed to be right now. And obviously it's Oklahoma that can change by noon and it'll be 50 mile per hour (laughs) come Saturday night. But 
and they and they use that as an excuse of why they don't pass the ball, I'm going to lose it. Because mm-hmm. that shows you how weak mentally this team is. Which we already question their mental toughness as it is. But at the same time, they have no depth. So it's really, it's like a, like it's a double-edged sword for them. Like they can't win right now. They play hard for 90 plays a game because you got guys out there that literally play 90 plays a game, Danny Stutzman, uh-huh. others. And then at the same time, you got people questioning their mental toughness. And we we defend them, Parker. We've defended them on that part because they have zero depth. And I think, I think that I think the 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 cold weather. If it wasn't rainy in West Virginia, that may that changes some things. Like cold weather actually works in the favor because your your body doesn't get worn out. As, you know what I mean? Like because you don't need as much. I guess you'd need fluid. I was, I was talking to a coach the other day. Literally one of the. Um, a, a big name coach um, just was given kind of talking to him a little bit. And I asked him that about the cold weather and how much more tired the players get as opposed to the heat. And he said it actually, the cold weather actually helps them because it, I guess it restricts their vasodeferens or whatever he said. And uh, the, the, the blood flow and it allows them not to get as, sore and tired as the season goes on the colder the weather is the warmer the weather that's why they do the hot cold baths he said so the warmer the weather obviously you get more sore because blood flow is going more i guess he said i and i don't know if he knows what he's talking about i have no idea because i know zero about it i may stay at holiday inns but i got no zero 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 knowledge when it comes to science and biology and physiology and all that crap like i'm i'm an idiot when it comes to that stuff so i'm just going off what i was told so i I, I, he this person says that they think that the cold weather actually helps players play longer and i guess it makes sense a little bit but still 90 plays is is 90 plays and you got a 300 pounder pushing on you i there's no way you're not going to be tired right like that's that's just not going to happen. Um, what's your final score? Did you already say that? Did you tell the final? I don't think you said the final score. You just said you predicted Oklahoma State to win. Yeah, I said twenty-seven twenty on 27, the twenty. Okay, Oklahoma State. on the live. Yeah, yeah. I was just talking about on this podcast. You, you didn't say. You just said you predicted Oklahoma State to win. I got Oklahoma thirty-three thirty. My confidence level is about twenty-five percent, though. <laughs> in my pick. <laughs> I just don't trust this team. I just don't. I, I don't know how you can. I hope they prove us wrong Saturday. Uh, I, I really they, do. Again, like trust is something that is earned. <laughs> and mm-hmm. This team hasn't earned anybody's trust this year. No. No. They are average as average, and they could be below average come Saturday night about 1030. Ugh. Thinking about that being five and six, like that's something I haven't seen since Blake. And it's not something I want to see at Oklahoma because I just don't, I don't want to live in a world where OU fans have to put up with that because that means we have to put up with it. We love you guys, but guys aren't used to losing and it's, it's a, it's shown by their actions on social media and the message boards right now. The good news, however, is that despite the average or below average play that Oklahoma's put out there on the field this year. Recruiting has stayed good. And National Signing Day is almost here, and they've held on to the recruits this whole time. It is unbelievable. They've lost three guys throughout this whole cycle. Ashton Cozart, Spencer, um, uh, Caleb Spencer, and uh, the guy that we won't mention <laughs> that flipped to Texas because the fans don't want to hear his name. But having said that, that's not too shabby, bro. That's not too shabby. Can all things considered, if you only lose three guys throughout the whole cycle, I mean, Georgia's lost commits. They've lost like two in the last two weeks. 
It, fans, it's happening everywhere. Oklahoma is not exclusive to decommits. But 95%, 90-95% of the players, they stick in the class. They chose Oklahoma for various reasons, and they don't look at it like fans. Is that fair to say? Yes, I think that's definitely fair to say. Well, I mean, you get the fans that, like, freak out over every little detail. And any time Oklahoma loses, like, oh, here we go. Decommit Central is happening. It's happening. And we're like, yeah, no, it's probably not, though. Like, it really probably isn't. Because these kids know that they're going to have a chance to come in and play instantly, number one. Number two, when you've been as good as Oklahoma's been, a season like this seems like an aberration, even to recruits. It's like, this isn't going to stick. Like, they're going to be good next year or the year after. Like, this isn't going to be how it's going to be because it's Oklahoma. And that's something Oklahoma can hold on to. Now, if they're doing this by twenty twenty in the 2024 season and they're still – Seven and five, eight and four. You got problems then. It's going to be harder to recruit at that point. But if they go eight and four next year, seven and five in 2023, I don't think you'll, because it, it may look as long, it, it may look better than this year's version of seven and five, five and six, or five and seven, or six and six, or whatever Oklahoma ends up with at, at this juncture. So, you can go back to back years of mediocrity and it'd be okay on the recruiting trail. It's not going to be great, but you can get away with it because you're Oklahoma and you have such a large uh, portfolio of winning in history. Because Nebraska got away with it for a long time too, until they didn't. But. If they do this for three years in a row, then you are Nebraska at that point, like, or you're becoming Nebraska at that point. And that's not something Oklahoma fans want to hear, but it's the truth. I don't think it's going to get to that point. I think they're a lot better next year. You've got experience. You're going to get more transfers in that are going to have experience. They're going to be more picky about that because they're not going to be coming in last second. They're going to have built in back channeling like we're gonna call them calling it what it is they're gonna have they're gonna have built-in back channeling that they can push towards oklahoma right like that's that's a fact yeah and everybody's back channeling these days yeah Yeah, like and you've seen i I think steve wilfong had a tweet about it a few days ago carl reed had a tweet about it just a couple days ago like that's the new normal in college football Mm -hmm. and like it's there are so many ways to game. Tampering's this okay. Yeah. Well, it's 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 not technically tampering, Brandon. As if long it as didn't you, happen. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, if it didn't happen and you didn't actually or you basically you maintained the proper um what's the word? Distance mm-hmm. between yourself and the actual player in which you're interested. Yes. So as long as as long as you know who to reach out to, and as long as you know how to, there's always an uncle. <laughs> that's the best way to. That's what best most concise way you could put it. There's always an uncle. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yep. And <laughs> the uh, the the fact that that is going on, like uh, Oklahoma didn't have a chance to do that last year because they weren't an established staff, like. They were building the staff up while they were trying to figure out who was in the portal, and they were just grabbing who they thought were the best guys in the portal that may come in and be able to help them depth-wise. This year, they're going to have an elite class coming in, just like they did last year. They got a top number eight class in the country, and Venables held on to that one. So that that the fact that Venables held on and actually grew – last year's class is 
why I find it really shocking that Oklahoma fans didn't think he could hold on to this year's class. You know what I mean? Like last year was a way worse scenario. They had like, they went from like 20 something commits to what down to 10 at one point. They had the number 21 class in America for yeah. hours after Riley up and left town. And it was the number nine class in America two months later. There you go. And they ended up number eight, right? If I remember correctly, with the transfers. No, it, was so, it was nine. They ended up nine. With transfers, nine. it might have been eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I have faith in BV holding on to the class. I do. I do. Now, that doesn't mean I don't, that a, a, a decommit or two may not happen. It's possible. You keep losing that you open the, you crack the door open for anybody to, look around at that point. But as long as Jackson Arnold is um, sticking around, and by the way, his dad is one of the nicest guys in the world. I talked to him for a while the other day via DM. Great guy. Um, you hold on to a guy like that, that's going to entice people. He's like a magnet, essentially, right? Like, people want to go play for a player with a quarterback like that, that all he's done is one, like literally all he's done his whole life is one. And when you have a winner like that, leading your class, that, 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 that leads to other players looking at now <clears throat> getting to the list outside of David Hicks which is just the, and Damian Sanford, which are the two biggest, obviously, guys on campus for obvious reasons, officially, official visitors wise. What do you think the biggest thing is this weekend for Oklahoma on the recruiting trail? Mm. Outside of winning, I mean, that's obvious. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. I'd say, are we talking like a specific player? Or are we talking like a specific? You can you can talk about whatever you want. Like, what is your opinion on this list, and what? Who does Oklahoma need to make sure they get? And who do you think the big? What do you think the biggest thing is for them to do outside of winning? And it could even be a person or a player that you think is the biggest whatever. Like it's a broad question, very generalized, but I'm leaving it open for you to take it wherever you want to take it. I think the biggest thing, man, is you got to make your layups, right? On the recruiting trail, you got to make your layups. And it seems like Oklahoma has two guys on campus this weekend that are pretty close to being layups in Taylor Wine and Ashton Sanders. Now, Wisconsin's a play for Ashton Sanders and has been, but with Taylor Wines, uh, Oklahoma Heritage, he's originally from Edmond. Uh, and then just how much love Ashton Sanders has shown to Oklahoma and the staff and the fan base on social media. You get the sense that even though those two guys have never visited campus yet, you can close them out this weekend. You can close out those recruitments if you make a strong enough impression. So, again, when you got a layup, you got to go and hit it. And for me, what's important this weekend is that the Sooners do that because we're not going to find out. I mean, I would love it if we did, but we're not going to find out this weekend what the final decision is for DJ Hicks or Damian Sanford or Peyton Bowen, right? So you're going to be waiting on those probably until early signing day. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you have the opportunity to add two players to this class that are immediate plug and play replacements uh, for guys that you've lost in this class already. Well, I guess Ashton Sanders is, but I, you, you lose Colton Vosick, the Sooners turned around and offered Taylor wine and you see wine's film. Look, he's not Vosick because Vosick's a freak show, man, but you see a lot of the same qualities in the way that Taylor wine plays the position and plays football. So I mean, there's, there's there's a reason why it seems like half the P5 programs in America have come knocking on that kid's door ever since the midway point of his senior year. 
So knowing that a kid like that grew up right down the road in Edmond, that's a battle you have to win yeah. at this point in time. Those are the types of battles where there, there shouldn't even be a question, right? You get the kid on campus, you close him out because this is a staff that should be able to do that with guys like that. So obviously the most significant aspect of the weekend as it pertains to recruiting is how much of a stride can you make with Sanford, especially, but also Hicks and also Bowen. I think second to that would be, and make your layups. Mm -hmm. Close out the easy ones. And those should be easy ones. Yeah. Would you throw Kendall Dolby in that one? As far as the layups? Not, not necessarily, just because, I look, I, I like where Oklahoma stands with Kendall Dolby, certainly. But... I know he just narrowed his list to 10. It doesn't seem like he's in any particular hurry uh, to figure out where the landing spot's going to be. And I know he's got some, he's got some other big time offers as well. Uh, Arkansas just jumped in the boat a couple of days ago with an offer. Um, OU is not the only big time school that is looking his way. And he's also originally from the state of Ohio. So he doesn't have that localized pull to OU uh, even though he does play up in Miami at NAO. So, yeah, I think I think the visit is big as it pertains to being able to add an experienced guy to that secondary and uh, potentially closing out on Dolby before early signing day. But I, I, I don't know if I would necessarily quantify that as a layup, at least not yet. I gotcha. <laughs> but so you, you get those two layups – that builds a little momentum. You have a you have guys like I mean, there's a lot of five stars on campus, by the way, this weekend. And we'll get into that here in just a second. But one of those is um Peyton Bowen. He's back. <laughs> and I obviously so if, if people don't know and you're not on know you insider, I typed up the uh the list at like two AM. I was doing typing up some other things and um I was going through a, a long list of OU commits because there's so many OU commits on campus this weekend. And instead of typing OU offer dash Notre Dame commit, I typed OU commit next to Peyton Bowen's name. And yeah, there it, was a little minor internet freak out over that one. Yes, there was. Luckily, caught it about 7 a.m. in the morning and I went over to the Notre Dame site and apologized. I was like, dudes, look, 2 a.m., I looked over everything, skimmed through it. Everything looked good, and I totally missed the fact that I put commit instead of offer next to Peyton Bowen's name. My bad. Um, and then, uh, you know, they locked the thread. Um, Notre Dame expects him to commit or stay committed to them. And that's I, I expect Notre Dame to think that um, after he visited. But here's the crazy part is, is when you talk to people at Geyer after he got back from Notre Dame visit, there was a lot of um, – and still is a lot of people that think this thing's trending Oklahoma still. Um, and the NIL collective, and we'll talk about that too real quick um, – Crimson and Cream Collective. I don't know. Have they released day three? Have they released the day three uh, findings just yet? No, I don't think so. Not that I've seen. For the numbers? They have not. But as of yesterday, in two days of the campaign, they have $413,000 raised. I'm going to assume it's going to be close to 500000 or 600000 or so with the matching, um, which is great. That's great. If you can get $600,000 in three days, you're on pace for almost 5 million. If you can get the donor to match up to 2.5. Uh, and this is a big donor, by the way, like it's a big name donor. And so, um, <sighs> It's not it's not a coincidence, Parker, that this is happening and it's ending right before National Signing Day. Not a coincidence whatsoever. And when you have the 
athletic director, the president, and the uh, head football coach publicly supporting it? You got these dudes on campus. You got DJ Hicks, Sanford, and Peyton Bowen on campus. Do you find it a coincidence? Because I do. We're not a coincidence, I guess. Yeah, I was about to say, it's it, it, it's the opposite of a coincidence. Yeah, it's not a coincidence. Well, it seems They're very literally calculated. doing it on purpose. Like, hey, this money is for you. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I guess at the end of the day, if you're Oklahoma and you already have, you've already thrown out an offer to begin with before he committed to A&M, and now you're going to up the offer with some extra NIL that's been raised by the fan base. Um, what do you think the odds are DJ Hicks sticks with A&M? They're going to beat UMass this weekend, but then they have LSU. I mean, four and eight is staring them right in the face. Ten percent right now. Ten percent odds he sticks with A&M. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you think it's an Oregon it's, Oklahoma battle? That's what it feels. Like. Well, like yeah, I don't want to feel like that. And look, as much as people don't want to hear this, I don't want to discount Texas either. Mm-hmm. I don't because, and I, I, I know Brandon. Trust me, I know. But here's do you the thing. Think, do you, I don't know because he had a chance to go visit them last week and he didn't do it. You know what Texas has a lot of money. Bingo. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm not 100 percent discounting them. Because no, I mean, that's he, fair. He, no, that's fair. Yeah, I'm with Does you. Like can be a Longhorn? Anything. Absolutely not. Not right now. But you know, we saw where this went once. Who's to say it can't go there again? But they just haven't been recruiting him. That's the th- crazy part. Like he's a, he's about locker room and friendships and who's in there with him. And they they haven't they haven't gone after his best friend. I think that's probably the biggest biggest deal. Have they offered Sanford yet? I don't think so. I think they're kind of the one school among yeah X's legit considerations right now that hasn't. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. On the live, I asked you this, and if you want to see the list, the full list, and there's probably, I'm trying to think, there's one, two, three. I think there's five or six five stars on campus this week, right? So you Between have 25. There's 25. Owen, you have Hicks. You have Jackson David PJ. Stone, you have PJ. You have Jackson Arnold. That's five. And you got the 25, 25 linebacker out of Cali. Noah, Noah McHale. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's six. six. Yep. Yeah. Six, five stars. Sure enough. Yeah. Fans kind of a big deal this weekend. You and, can see the whole list on OU Insider. If you want to go there, it is yeah. ridiculous. And you've got Nigel Smith, who is right there on that the close yeah. to being yeah, a five. 38 and 32 is where the cutoff is. So, um, National Signing Day of, in this, just 2023, if you want to go 24, we'll go 20. Out of 23 and 24, come, okay, we'll do this first. Out of 23 on National Signing Day, how many of the visitors are signing with Oklahoma that, I mean, not counting the commits that are on campus. I mean, that's a given. So hang on, what's I'm I'm unclear. What's the question? So how of the non-commits, how many are signing with Oklahoma that are taking visits this weekend, unofficially and officially? In twenty twenty three. I got well, it over under or am I just throwing a dart? Okay, over under three and a half. Over. Over. Ooh. That means he thinks there's some five stars that are signing with Oklahoma. I mean, look, I th- <laughs> I've made my stance clear on one particular five star for quite some time, mm-hmm. and there's a uh, there's a fan base up in Indiana that's not too thrilled with me about it. And I'm a believe it when I see it with him, just because. And I, look, I I 
talk to people very, very close around him and they all feel like Oklahoma is the odd odds on bet. But until he does it, I'm just like, cause it's just been like yeah, drug, look, I, I, drug out for four months. No, I, and I'm with you. Um, I think just there's, there's too much smoke for there not to be fire. I just don't know when the fire comes and I'm going to quit acting like, and I have quit acting like I have any idea when the fire will come. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe here in the next, I know he doesn't want to be going into Thanksgiving and still not know where he's going that I do know. So I think this is kind of a big deal this week for him and his brother. Um, and his girlfriend did sign with Oklahoma soccer team. So Emma signed and that's kind of a big deal. Mm-hmm. So of the 2024 visitors over under five signing. Uh, see, now I got to run through my mental list of who's coming and who's not. And I will help you. Okay. With that real quick as you have... sit there and ponder it a little bit i can already <laughs> think it i can already think of at least a couple that i believe oklahoma ends up with so you have david stone dax hill eli nigel jay Aaron flyers flowers scott wesco bricks utley gage so far oh and waffle and um i think that's it so far but that's as still quite a at, bit. As I look at this list, I would say it's a push for me at five. I would I would put it at five. I'm with you. I think there are five guys on this list that I have right now in my mind that I would say, yeah, those guys are going to be Sooners. Well, here's the thing. Is I think Dax Collins gets an offer at some point, and I think he's a sooner. I'll just go ahead and name him. I think Jaden Hardy, Eli Bowen, Nigel, that's four, end up as Sooners. David Wesco, Stone. Wesco, that's five. Gage, that's six. I'll go six. I'll go six. So no David Stone. I said Stone. He was the first one I named. Oh really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and, and no, I named Colin Stone. Okay, so Stone, Collins, Bowen, Nigel, Hardy. What seven? I'll go seven. Wow, seven. I'll go seven. There's Brandon. That doesn't mean it's going to end up like that. I'm just predicting. That's how, as we sit, 13 months before National Signing Day for 2024, Oklahoma's in a really good spot with those. And actually, Aaron Flowers is a guy that. Yeah. Oklahoma feels really good about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Him and him and uh, uh, Phil Simi are the guys that they really like at safety. So that side of DFW, man, I'm telling you, Oklahoma's about to put the clamps on it in 24. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake about that. Yep. And honestly, I, I think David Stone being back at Dell City or somewhere in Oklahoma to finish out his senior year is there's a decent chance that happens. And if that does have, I, I'll tell you this, there are schools trying to work on people around David stone to try to make that not happen. It has nothing. And people are going to instantly think it's Cooper and it's not Sean Cooper. Like Sean Cooper has nothing to do with this. Like get this out of people's heads. Like he is not pushing people to Michigan state. Michigan state is Morgan Pearson's best offer. Yeah. Morgan Pearson and Zadavian Sims are really good friends. They traveled everywhere together. Seven on seven. They train together. They're with each other all the time. But if Zadavian Sims' mom, the, 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 you want to talk about like Todd Bates is her favorite. She said it. Todd Bates is her favorite as far as like who's been recruiting her. So, like this isn't like just in if he does end up committing this weekend in to Michigan State, it's you got 13 months to flip it. 13 months. And Oklahoma understands that. Like they're well aware of the situation that's going on right now. And they they also understand that they can't control. 
And guess what? Who's to say come national the day before national signing day, Oklahoma doesn't offer Morgan Pearson <clears throat> or the week before. Like that's not out of the realm of possibility, folks. You got to think about it. They've been recruiting Morgan. So just relax, relax on the Michigan state stuff. Even with David stone, there are people that want David outside of the state of Oklahoma. And those people are getting worked on by other coaches to keep David at IMG because if they keep him at IG, it keeps him away from Norman. Cause if he comes back to Oklahoma, he'll be in Norman every week. His sister goes to OU. Mm-hmm. He'll be in Norman every week. When he's been back, when he's been back over the summer, he was in Norman almost two or three times a week at the OU facility taking visits. Just chilling with Coach with Coach Bates. Just chilling. He's like, dude, I was there almost every day, felt like. Because that's that's just how, how he is. He loves OU. He loves Coach Bates. So and, it, and this has made it harder. If he's at IMG, it makes it very much more difficult for Oklahoma to land David Stone. But it doesn't make it impossible. It, I still would put Oklahoma the odds aren't favorite. But you got to, like, let this play out. It's 13 months away. Let's see what happens over the summer. Let's see what Stone does when he starts to really, really narrow things down with his recruitment because he's the number three player in the country right now, right? Number four. Number Number four. four. Yep. I don't think that really matters between three and four, but um, yeah. (laughs) He has a chance to be the number one player in the country by the end of the cycle. Like he's that good. Yeah. And that, that said, I, I would be surprised if anybody other than Dylan Ryle is the number one player in the country, but it is going to be a very uh, compelling battle between David Stone and Williams Nguyenary for the moniker of number one overall defensive player. And, and guess what? Is going to be in that conversation too. But yeah, guess 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 who probably leads for both of those guys. Uh huh. <laughs> I mean, relax. Things are changing in Norman. It may not be in the 2023 season. Become 24-25, or excuse me, the 2022 season, become 23-24-25, things are going to be completely different. The roster is going to look, when you look at the players on the field, it's going to look completely different than what they look like now. Like, they're going to look like the dudes that you see in the SEC. And that is the goal. Matter of fact, I was talking to a source last night, and they said, it's, Gentry Williams is six foot six one, right? And they said he will be considered short and small in the DB room over the next few years. Wrap your head around it because that dude has arms that hangs down to his ankles. Think about that. Think about the difference in the old days where it was, if you had a 5'10", DB, it was a good deal at Oklahoma because that means they weren't super, super, super short. Now a six foot six one dude is looking to be a short DB in the in the cornerback safety room. Times are changing. They're changing. So all right, Parker. That's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. Uh if you're not on this YouTube. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. If you aren't subscribed to us on iTunes, Google Play, um, Spotify, whatever you get your Stitcher, whatever you get your podcast on with, make sure you subscribe, hit the like, give us five stars. Um, We're going to have a lot more podcast stuff coming as the season rolls on, as it gets closer to National Signing Day. We're even going to have some interviews with some of the top uh, players and commits in the 23 23 class as we get close to National Signing Day. And uh, I think we're going to get – I'm going to try to get the uh, Belser, the leader of the collective, on with us as well so we can get some questions answered and get it out to the people as well. Uh, So we have a lot coming for you guys on OU Insider podcasts and lives and stuff like that. 
if you are a subscriber to OU Insider VIP, $1 for the first month, $9.95 afterwards. Literally, you can get $1, get you all the way through National Signing Day right now. I think it's a heck of a deal. Just saying. So uh, give us a shot. Give us a try. If you want to see, you want to be on top of everything, come National Signing Day, all the recruiting information, because there's a lot of five stars that Oklahoma could, you know, that they're in on closing this thing out. So it's going to be interesting as they close out this class in 2023. On top of that, it's 30% off if you want to do a whole year, which means it's only $75, gets you a whole year, and it gets you every 24-7 VIP site, Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas, Texas A&M, Georgia, Ohio State, you name it, USC, you get access to that. So you can see the targets that Oklahoma's in on, the teams they're going up against. You can go look and see what they're saying about them on those sites as well. So it's a great deal. We'd love to have you guys on there. Can't wait. Uh, plus, if you hold off a little bit, uh, Black Friday is coming up starting on the 22nd. And I think you guys may enjoy uh, the access that is coming up. So just pay attention. Keep your eyes peeled on promos. So uh, hope to see you guys on OU Insider VIP. We're growing, growing, growing. Uh, and we can't thank you guys enough, Oklahoma fans, for being on there with us. All right. For Parker Thune, my name's Brandon Drum. Thank you all so much for watching this edition of and listening to this edition of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. You guys have a blessed day.